Welcome back to Garth Road Baptist Church's <coughs> adult Bible study class where we have been studying life lessons that we can learn from the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, last Sunday morning, we learned how we can weather the storms of life like Paul. And, and I, I love that uh, Bible story uh, in the life of Paul. You know, the, the storm gets real bad. They think they're going to die and then it gets better. And when they think that, you know, hey, there's land, we'll be, we're going to be all right. They shipwreck and the ship tears apart and they still have to swim for their lives back to shore. Yeah, and through it all, Paul remained faithful. He continued, you know, he had on his side a promise of God. Christ Jesus himself had promised that he would make it to uh, Rome alive. And so Paul had that promise um, in his back pocket the whole time. But he never stopped living God's purpose for his life all the way up until you know the end uh, but it was really neat you know when we study that bible story that we see those four anchors that uh, god provides to us that will help us weather the storms of life like paul did and those of course are god's people god's promises for provision and protection uh, and then god's purpose for our life and finally our prayer what an amazing blessing that we get to talk directly to our God. We don't have to go through intermediaries of any sort. We don't have to pray to dead people. and We don't have to pray to statues of dead people. We can open our hearts and commune directly one-on-one -on -one with our God creator and our Savior. And that is a blessing that a lot of those uh, fake religions, in fact, all of the fake religions, they ain't got that. They have no way to, to talk directly with their fake God. Only Christians have that blessing. And of course, as I always do, I asked you a quick question last Sunday morning. Which of those four anchors has most often been your most effective anchor during your storms of life? And then follow it up with a simple why. And again, I'm not asking anyone to stand up and testify, but something to think about. And now I've mentioned for me, the two best anchors in there, um, I love prayer, but when when I look around, the two anchors I grab hold of the most and, and have been the most beneficial in my life is God's promises and God's people. I haven't always been sure of God's purpose for my life. I, I think sometimes that I'm not good enough, uh, there's something else, or I'm not doing good enough or whatever, um, but God's promises have always remained true. And God's people are a blessing beyond imagination. Um, but this Sunday morning, we will continue. Actually, we're going to conclude our continuing Bible study series on the life lessons we can learn from the life of the Apostle Paul on how to finish your race with grace, just like Paul did. Now, we will find our final Bible study lesson in Acts chapter 28. We're going to be going through it piece by piece. So we're not going to read the whole chapter uh, 28 up front. We're going to be breaking it into little pieces as we go through. Um, but last Sunday morning, we last saw Paul and his companions shipwrecked on their way to Rome as Paul was a Roman prisoner. Now, after they were safely on land, they discovered that they were on the island of Melita, which is in more modern uh terminology we call it Malta so they were on the the small island of Malta which is about 60 miles south of Sicily and about 300 miles directly south of Rome where Paul would ultimately finish his life's race now in this final chapter of Acts we will discover from this great apostle three things that we must do if we want to finish our race with grace just like Paul we're going to start in Acts chapter 28 verses 1 through 10 and God's holy word declares, and when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, they came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said amongst themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped to sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. 
In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. And when this was done, others also, which had diseases on the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. So the first thing that we must do, if we want to finish our race with grace, is just like Paul, is first, do not give up. So while on Malta, Dr. Luke wrote that the islanders showed them no little kindness, meaning great kindness they built a fire and welcomed them all because of the present rain and because of the cold it was cold and wet and they see these strangers come onto their land and they built a fire and took care of them that's you know pretty interesting because dr luke used the term barbarous people and so that doesn't sound very barbarous when we think of barbarous we think of you know barbarians if you will we we think of um Uh, violent or primitive people but this word does not necessarily imply that they are violent or primitive rather it simply implies that they were foreigners they were neither Greek Jew nor Roman but most likely Phoenicians who had settled on the island uh, long before so when Paul though added some wood that he had gathered onto the fire he was bit by a poisonous snake which fastened on his hand So the islanders were apparently a very superstitious bunch and assumed that Paul was a murderer whom, though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Now my wife comes from a little tropical island paradise over there near Australia, Indonesia area, and I can tell you they're a very superstitious bunch. If something happens just coincidentally once, it's now, you know, a superstition, it's always going to be like that. And so I can understand, you know, looking at this, how these folks, they very a snake bit someone it's got to be because that person is horrible you know they deserved it Uh, but that's not necessarily the case as we know but paul simply shook off the beast into the fire and he felt no harm that's pretty a tough guy right there you know but uh, in acts chapter 28 verse 6 we read that how be it they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him they changed their minds and said that he was a god. You know, again, the superstitious bunch that they are. Well, he survived something this deadly. He's got to be a god if, you know, to do that. But remember that nothing at all could kill Paul at this point because God was not yet finished with his purpose for Paul's life. Christ Jesus had already promised Paul that he would arrive alive in Rome. And as if that is not enough, consider the precious promise found in Philippians chapter 1, and verse 6. And this, Paul wrote this, keep that in mind. Paul wrote this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who better to write that than Paul? Paul knew firsthand that if God says it will be so, it will be so. God had already declared Paul will be in Rome. So with all this other stuff going on, Paul still has that precious promise of Christ Jesus in his back pocket with him all the time. But later, the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, probably the Leurai of the island, and in my wife's native language, Leurai simply means local king, if you will. Um, but the, the king of the island hosted Paul and Dr. Luke in his home for three days. So while lodging there with Publius, whose father lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, which is dysentery, by the way, Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Of course, Malta, being a relatively small island, the news spread very quickly, attracting others also which had diseases in the island, and they came and were healed. God's Holy Spirit, working through Paul, empowered him with the ability to heal. Why? To authenticate Paul as an apostle which Paul undoubtedly used as an opportunity to share the gospel with those folks on Malta. Now, after two confining and bleak years in prison in Caesarea, the violent storm at sea, and the shipwreck, Paul could have been about ready to give up. But Paul knew that truth that he later wrote in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
Since Paul and his companions had already lost all of their possessions in the shipwreck, when they left the island three months later, the islanders graciously gifted them supplies that they would need for their journey. You see, this life lesson from the life of Apostle Paul teaches us that to finish our race with grace, we should never give up. What an amazing story. He had every reason to want to give up. I mean, think of how difficult this journey has been. Besides the two years in prison, which he was actually in the castle, um, but not in a dungeon. He was actually relatively, excuse me, uh, decent conditions, but still a prisoner. The ship, uh, the, the voyage, if you will, that horrible storm that they all thought they were going to die. Two, now, I don't know about y'all, two weeks of rocking on the waves can make you really wick, uh, weak and sick. Any, uh, any of you ever get motion sickness out there at all on the waves? I have. Um, it, it can be rough and worse when I'm in the airplane in the, when I was 82nd Airborne Division. Those airplanes don't not, uh, fly nice and calm and straight. Well, they fly what we call nap of the earth. So we're going up and down like a roller coaster ride. After a few hours of that, I can tell you, ain't nobody's belly got nothing left in it. These guys, two weeks long, they had been tossed by the ocean waves in this storm. They had, I mean, who, who can blame them for thinking they're about to die? There's no way they could eat anything with all that tossing and turning. Two weeks in the storm and then the shipwreck. And now they're just out on this island, but at least they're being well cared for. Paul had every reason to give up, but he did not give up. So when you are trying to finish your race with grace, and I'm not encouraging anyone to finish your race today. Um, I'm just saying that if you want to finish your race with grace, never give up. Whatever God's purpose is for your life, never give up on that purpose. God said it will be so, then I promise you it will be so. Second, you need to fellowship with fellow Christians. In Acts chapter 28, verses 11 through 15, we read, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Apai Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. After three months in Malta, waiting out the winter, Paul, Dr. Luke, and the other passengers boarded a ship and sailed by way of Syracuse on Sicily to Regium, on the toe of Italy. Now on their way to Rome, Paul and his associates were greeted by some fellow Christians from Rome who came to meet Paul at three taverns, about 35 miles south of Rome. So he just spent a week with these Christians down around the toe of Italy. But now as they're marching up to Rome, the Christians in Rome came out to greet Paul just south, 35 miles south of Rome. That's pretty neat right there. Um, I mean, again, the last three years were obviously difficult and probably very discouraging for Paul because he was arrested in Jerusalem, spent two years in prison in Caesarea, and was now concluding a very difficult seven-month journey. Therefore, as Paul visited with these Christians from Rome, he thanked God and took courage. What a sweet testimony of the power of Christian fellowship. Never underestimate the power you have in visiting with fellow Christians who may be going through a storm and just need your friendship to encourage them to keep on keeping on. And maybe you can't stop by. Maybe you can call or text. And I'm, I'm as guilty as the, the worst of them. I get caught up. I, I, I'm pretty busy at work. I, when I get home, I'm tied up in Bible study, and I, I forget to call people when I want to. I need to set like alarms or something on my phone. Um, but it can be difficult to set time aside depending on how busy you are. But if we can do so, imagine what a blessing you can be in the lives of others. Here, Paul, he's, he's worn out. But these folks came 35 miles out just to meet and greet him and to fellowship a little bit with him. It was very uplifting. It says that he thanked God and took courage. 
which means that he had been a little discouraged, that he needed to take courage. That's a that's an amazing uh, thing right there. It's uh, I, I just I think we can learn a lot from that one uh, phrase right there that he thanked God and took courage. Why did he thank God and take courage? Because of the fellowship of fellow Christians. You know, you might get a little temporary pleasure out of fellowship with, you know, the heathens of the world. But uh, can you thank God and take courage from that? I doubt it. But you can when you're fellowshipping with fellow Christians. We are here to lift each other up and to help make each other better. But probably the most encouraging thing to Paul, though he had never yet been to Italy, were that there were many fellow Christians there. And they were willing to come greet him. But how did they become Christians? Some people like to ask the question. So I'll go ahead and address that one really quickly. We have to remember all the way back to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Peter's sermon in Jerusalem resulted in over 3,000 people being saved and baptized. And we know that there were visitors there from all over the world, which included strangers of Rome. These people apparently went back to Rome and started th their own church there. They had never met Paul personally, but they received his epistle, Romans, written on his third missionary journey. Paul must have been especially encouraged to see God already at work in a country Paul had never even yet visited. See, all of us need a good Christian church wherever we go because we are always going to weather storms of life that can discourage us. So if you're ever traveling out of town, spend a little time on the web first and look up. You know, uh, Don't just look up church or don't look up Baptist churches because not every church that claims to be Baptist is necessarily a Baptist church. They could be just as bad as any non-denominational or Pentecostal rock and roll concert. We don't know just because they throw the word Baptist up there. we got a few churches here in town which lie and put Baptist on their, their signs. When you go in there, that's not a Baptist church. It's a rock concert with a pep rally. That's it. Uh, two of them that I can think of specifically. There's probably even more. Um, some of them have changed you know, part of their name to, so they don't sound quite as Baptist in the name. But make sure you're looking for the right type of church. Is it a King James Bible church? Are they really independent? Are they fundamental? Do they stick to the fundamentals of the, the term Baptist and what that means? Just because they have the term Baptist doesn't mean they are. It's just like, you know, the old saying, you can stand in the garage, you don't make you no know, Ferrari. I don't, you can stand there all day, but you ain't going to be no car at all. So Paul was very encouraged by the fellowship of his, these fellow Christians and to see that the church had grown well. We, he, he's looking forward to visiting this home church, if you will, not a home church, but this church and where he's going. And this is why God commands us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another even, also ye do, even as also ye do. See, God's Christian church is the original support group. We don't need all those other little groups out there that exist. Excuse me. All we need is right here. God's church. Blood washed, born again Christians who love God and love serving him and fellowship with other Christians. So from the, the life of Paul, we learn that to finish our race with grace. One, we should never give up. And two, we should fellowship with fellow Christians. And third, never stop sharing the gospel. In Acts chapter 28, verses 16 through 31, this is a little longer passage. We're going to go ahead and read it anyway. God's holy word declares, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, 
to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto Paul, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed Paul a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when we had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no men forbidding him. See, after they arrived in the most influential and powerful city in the world with a population of around two million, about half of which were actually slaves, Paul was placed under house arrest with a Roman soldier. But Paul used his liberty to continue to live God's purpose for his life. So even though he's under house arrest, he basically used this rented house as his, his mission field, if you will, the headquarters. So he just calls everybody in there where he's at. He's got liberty to do so. Nobody seems to care what he's doing. So he just calls people in over there and he calls the, the chief leaders uh, of uh, the Jews in Rome to come visit with him. And when they arrived, he made clear his innocence of any crime against his people, the Jews, and explained his appeal to Caesar. But Paul also explained, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you, and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. The hope of Israel refers to the prophesied Messiah. And Paul further explained to them the gospel he proclaimed is consistent with this hope of Israel and is not a departure from Judaism, but the fulfillment of its prophecies. So Paul explained to them that he was in prison for declaring the Messiah had arrived and was raised from the dead. Because the Jews wanted to hear more, though, a date was set for a second meeting. And at that meeting, Paul expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And according to Acts chapter 28 and verse 24, some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. You know, there are limits to what we can do to win others for Christ. Even the greatest apostle could not win everybody. Christ Jesus didn't win everybody. They still murdered him. All he did is speak love and truth. And they murdered him. What makes us think that you know, we're a failure if someone doesn't hear us out. No, we're not a failure. You're still victorious if you're still telling others about Christ Jesus, regardless of the outcome. It's not our job to save people. All we can do is present with them the gospel and the opportunity to accept salvation. It's not our job to, to argue with them or beat them over the head about it. Uh, yesterday, uh, I was talking to this atheist, and it became very clear he was an angry atheist, not just an atheist, but an angry atheist. It became clear it was not going to be fruitful to waste a whole lot of oxygen on a man who is refusing to consider anything superstitious for his words. But he's sitting in a superstitious, superstitious chair, I guess, too. You know? Somebody had to make it. It didn't just materialize out of thin air. But what good would it have done for me to argue with that knucklehead? It would not have done a lick of good. I shared with him the, the gospel in its most basic form and sent him on his way. Get your food and 
and have a great weekend. Doing anything more than that would have been destructive to the gospel. And I'm not saying I'm some kind of special guy for doing it right. I'm just saying that we can learn a lesson. Paul, the greatest apostle of all time, one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. Don't get discouraged. Just keep on keeping on. We are to give people the opportunity to receive or reject Christ, but we must respect their right to make their own bad decisions. We should present the gospel clearly and confidently, but we must not manipulate people into making decisions they are not ready to make or don't even believe. And we've heard about this before. People will, you know, okay, well, just say this prayer and you'll be good to go. That's not salvation. If they don't believe a word of it and they're just repeating words that you told them to say just to get you to shut up, you haven't led anyone to Christ. You have failed in your mission. Our job is to present the gospel. If they reject it, that's on them. Paul didn't get discouraged and quit just because some of these people didn't believe in what he said. He kept on because he knew God's purpose for his life. Paul concluded his presentation by quoting what God said through Isaiah when their forefathers heard the word of God, but because of calloused hearts and pride did not understand. And then Paul told them that because of their rejection of the gospel, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Not that they may hear it or that they might hear it, but that they will hear it. And that's a fulfilled prophecy right there. I don't know about y'all, but I happen to be a Gentile. I heard it. I thank God that I heard it. The Jews may reject Christ Jesus, but you know, I thank God for those of us who have not only uh, received Christ Jesus, but have continued to live for Christ Jesus even thereafter. In Acts chapter 28, verse 30, we read that Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. So for two years, Paul was able to welcome all who stopped by to visit with him, and, and they were apparently free to come and go as they pleased, as we see. That's pretty, again, as, as a prisoner. Now, understand, Paul is not a regular prisoner. He's not being accused of anything vile. Um, he's not a murderer. He's not a criminal. He's not a thief. And he's also a Roman citizen an educated Roman citizen at that. He's going to be given, uh, it's kind of like the federal prison system. You know, for the white crimes, they, they get their, it's basically a resort somewhere, um, but they can't leave. But they have so much freedom in those prisons. Um, whereas, you know, you're a local criminal, you're going to end up in, you know, Harris County. Of course, they'll let you go. It doesn't matter how many people you murder. They're probably just going to tell you to go on the streets. But the prisons are a lot tougher for you know, the, the, the street folk, if you will. Paul's not considered a street folk. He's a Roman citizen. So they set him up nice and proper. It probably also had something to do with Publius. Um, Publius probably had some good things to say about him. Not Publius. Um, Julius, I mean, the, the Roman centurion. Julius had some nice things to say about him when, you know, he delivered Paul. This guy did this and this and this. He's a great guy. He saved us. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the salvation uh, by, uh, through, by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about he literally saved them from death on the open seas. Paul would be something of a hero in, in normal life. But instead, they can't just throw him in a dungeon uh, at this time. So he ends up, he rents a house and he gets to stay there. He's got a... Uh, a Praetorian guard with him, uh, most likely chained together because he does mention the chains. You, you know, a lot of it is kind of supposition. We believe that he was chained to a guard and they rotated every few hours, um, but it's never specified or clarified. Um, but we know we can look at Roman tradition, but he does mention his hired house, his rented house, if you will, and the chain. So uh, we believe that to be true. But when visitors came to visit with Paul, according to Acts chapter 28 and verse 31, we read that he continued preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So again, he had no one stopping him from preaching uh, the gospel, but he continued to do it. Even in chains, he still preached the love of God. What an amazing testimony right there. 
That's finishing the race with grace. But his race is not yet over. During his house arrest, Paul wrote the, the uh, epistles of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. During this time, Paul was also uh, always watched and possibly, as I said, even chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard. Now, the Praetorian Guard were the elite soldiers assigned to guard the emperor. That's pretty cool. I mean, he's, he's like the Secret Service, if you will. So he's, he's with the Secret Service, and the Praetorian Guard was so close to the emperor that they, consi- they were considered the family of Caesar. Now, that's pretty... And, I don't know very many people within the Secret Service that are considered family to the president. But the Praetorian Guard were well respected and considered by the, you know, the Caesars. They, these guys were family to them, which was a lot of trust you put in the person who, you know, he's protecting your life. Here, he's just watching over, you know, Paul. But um, Paul had the opportunity to witness to these Praetorian guards as, as well as they had the opportunity to hear him talking to everybody else. Um, and Paul may have even won some of them to Christ Jesus because in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22, Paul sent greetings to the Philippians. Now this is, he's still in his home, uh, home arrest right here, house arrest in Rome. When he wrote this, he said, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Who could he be talking about? Well, he could be talking about Caesar's children. I don't know, but there's a high possibility he was talking about the Praetorian Guard who had received Christ Jesus because they were with him so much. Without knowing it, the Romans gave Paul a captive audience for these two years because each soldier assigned to watch Paul inevitably heard a clear presentation of the gospel at least once. And some, most likely, responded in faith. There was a statute of limitations, though, in Roman law. So if no accusers came for two years, then Paul was now set free. And, of course, Paul resumed his missionary work, and then he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus um, while running around free on the streets of Rome. However, around 64 AD, Rome was destroyed by fire. Now, history has told us that most likely Nero is responsible for that, but, of course, we know that Nero falsely accused the Christians resulting in a bloody persecution in which many church leaders were murdered. During that time, Paul was re-imprisoned for a second time, but unlike his first imprisonment, this time Paul was cast into a cold, damp dungeon. And Paul wrote 2 Timothy from that dungeon. Knowing he was soon to lose his head, about to be executed, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul wrote, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Shortly after writing those words, around 67 or 68 A.D., tradition tells us that Paul was beheaded and thus finished his race God set before him. As the Roman executioner raised his sword to chop off Paul's head, Paul could honestly pray what Christ Jesus himself prayed in John chapter 17 and verse 4. I have glorified thee on this earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest to me to do. Paul finished his race with grace. Something that we all can do. You see, one second, Paul was being murdered by a cruel Roman Roman executioner, but the very next second, Paul was alive forevermore in heaven, meeting our Savior, Christ Jesus, who I am certainly, a certain lovingly said to Paul, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. This was Paul's final time living God's purpose for his life. And he finished his race with grace. And if you plan on finishing your race with grace, remember the three rules that we've learned. First, Never give up. Second, fellowship with fellow Christians. And third, never stop sharing the gospel. What a powerful lesson from the life of Paul. He knows he's soon to die. He doesn't care. He's going to serve God with everything that's in him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Praise God for Paul. And Dr. Luke, who recorded this stuff for us. You know, I, 
I don't know about y'all, but I, I get a lot of encouragement from the life of Paul. And I've learned a lot of good lessons in this Bible study series. I, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. And although we're finishing up with, you know, concluding here, the life of Paul, we're going to be starting the life of Peter uh, next uh, Sunday morning, God willing. But as I always do, before I close out, I, I like to ask you one simple question. And this morning's question is, in which of these three areas, never give up, fellowship, fellow Christians, and never stop sharing the gospel, which of these three areas do you most need to improve? Again, you don't have to tell me. This is between you and God. Maybe you don't have to worry about not giving up because you're still coming here. Maybe you're still fellowshipping with fellow Christians because you're here. Maybe we just need to never stop sharing the gospel. I don't know what each of us needs to do more of, but if you want to finish your race with grace like Paul did, one of those three, uh, all three of those, but uh, you probably need to improve on at least one of them. So think about that, and, and I ask you to follow up. When will you begin? living those three life lessons from the life of the Apostle Paul. And then, of course, be sure to be right back here next Sunday morning as we start learning life lessons from the life of the Apostle Peter.